So a big question that we're facing now, and have been for quite a number of years now, are we at risk of a nuclear attack? Now, there's a bigger question that's probably actually more important than that, is the notion of permanently eliminating the possibility of a nuclear attack, eliminating the threat altogether. And I, I would like to make a case to you that over the years since we first developed atomic weaponry, until this very moment, we've actually lived in a dangerous nuclear world that's characterized by two phases, which I'm going to go through with you right now. First of all, we started off the nuclear age in 1945. The United States had developed a couple of atomic weapons through the Manhattan Project, and the idea was very straightforward. We would use the power of the atom to end the atrocities and the horror of this unending World War II that we had been involved in in Europe and in the Pacific. And in 1945, we were the only nuclear power. We had a few nuclear weapons, two of which we dropped on Japan in Hiroshima a few days later in Nagasaki in August of 1945, killing about 250,000 people between those two. And for a few years, we were the only nuclear power on Earth. But by 1949, the Soviet Union had decided it was unacceptable to have us as the only nuclear power, and they began to match what the United States had developed. And from 1949 to 1985 was an extraordinary time of a buildup of a nuclear arsenal that no one could possibly have imagined back in the 1940s. So by 1985, each of those red bombs up here is equivalent of 1,000 warheads. The world had 65,000 nuclear warheads and seven members of something that came to be known as the Nuclear Club. And it was an extraordinary time, and I'm going to go through some of the mentality that, we, that Americans and the rest of the world were experiencing, but I want to just point out to you that 95% of the nuclear weapons at any particular time since 1985 going forward, of course, were a part of the arsenals of the uh, United States and the Soviet Union. After 1985, and before the breakup of the Soviet Union, we began to disarm from a nuclear point of view. We began to counter-proliferate. And we dropped the number of nuclear warheads in the world to about a total of 21,000. It's a very difficult number to deal with because what we've done is we've, quote-unquote, decommissioned some of the warheads. They're still probably usable. They could be recommissioned. But the way they count things, which is very complicated, we think, that we, think we have about a third of the nuclear weapons we had before. But we also, in that period of time, added two more members to the nuclear club, Pakistan and uh, North Korea. So we stand today with a still fully armed nuclear arsenal among many countries around the world, but a very different set of circumstances. So I'm going to talk about a nuclear threat story in two chapters. Chapter one is 1949 to 1991, when the Soviet Union broke up. And what we were dealing with at that point and through those years was a superpowers nuclear arms race. It was characterized by a nation versus nation, very fragile standoff. And basically, we lived for all those years, and some might argue that we still do, in a situation of being on the brink, literally, of an apocalyptic planetary calamity. It's incredible that we actually lived through all that. We were totally dependent during those years on this amazing acronym, which is MAD, stands for Mutually Assured Destruction. So it meant if you, if you attacked us, we would attack you virtually simultaneously, and the end result would be a destruction of your country and mine. So the threat of my own destruction kept me from launching a, a nuclear attack on you. That's the way we live. And the danger of that, of course, is that a misreading of a radar screen could actually cause a counter-launch, even though the first country had not actually launched anything. During this chapter one, there was a high level of public awareness about the potential of nuclear catastrophe, and an indelible image was implanted in our collective minds that, in fact, a nuclear holocaust would be absolutely globally destructive and could in some ways mean the end of civilization as we know it. So this was chapter one. Now, the odd thing is that even though we knew that there would be that kind of civilization obliteration, we engaged in America in a series, in fact, in the Soviet Union, in a series of response planning. It was, it was absolutely incredible. So premise one is we'd be destroying the world, and then premise two is why don't we get prepared for it? So what we... <clears throat> 
what we offered ourselves was a collection of things. I'm just going to go skim through a few things just to, to jog your memories. If you were born after 1950, this is just consider this entertainment. Otherwise, it's, it's memory lane. This was Bert the Turtle. Was a turtle by the name of Bert. When danger threatened him, he never got hurt. He knew just what to do. He duck and cover. These children are practicing to duck and cover just as you do in your school. This was basically an attempt to teach our school children that if we did get engaged in a nuclear confrontation and uh, atomic war, then we uh, wanted our school children to kind of basically duck and cover. That was the principle. You'd, you, there would be a nuclear conflagration about to hit us, and if you get under your desk, things would be okay. <laughs> I, I didn't do all that well in psychiatry and medical school, but I was interested, and I, I think this was seriously delusional. <laughs> Secondly, we told people to go down in their basements and build a fallout shelter. Maybe it'd be a study when we weren't having an atomic war, or you could use it as a TV room, or as many teenagers found out, a very, very safe place for a little privacy with your girlfriend. And, and actually, so there are multiple uses of the, of the bomb shelters. Or you could buy a prefabricated bomb shelter that you could simply bury in the ground. Now, the bomb shelters at that point, let's say you bought a prefab one, it would be a few hundred dollars, maybe up to 500 if you got a fancy one. Yet, what percentage of Americans do you think ever had a bomb shelter in their house? What percentage lived in a house with a bomb shelter? Less than 2%, about 1.4% of the population, as far as anyone knows, did anything, either making a space in their basement or actually uh, building a bomb shelter. Many buildings, public buildings around the country, this is New York City, had these little civil defense signs, and the idea was that you would run into one of these shelters and be safe from the uh, nuclear weaponry. And one of the greatest governmental delusions of all time was something that happened in the early days of the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, as we now know and are well aware of their behaviors from Katrina. Here was their first big public uh, announcement. They would propose, and they actually there were, there were about six volumes written on this, a crisis relocation plan that was dependent upon the United States having three to four days warning <laughs> that the Soviets were going to attack us. So the, the goal was to evacuate the target cities. We would move people out of the target cities into the countryside. And I'm telling you, I actually testified at the Senate about the absolute ludicrous idea that we would actually evacuate and actually have three or four days warning, which is completely off the wall. Turns out that they had another idea behind it, even though this is, they were telling the public it's to save us. The idea was that we would force the Soviets to retarget their nuclear weapons, very expensive, and potentially double their arsenal to not only take out the original site, but take out sites where people were going. This was, this was what apparently, as it turns out, was behind all this. It was just really, really frightening. The main point here is we were dealing with a complete disconnect from reality. The civil defense programs were disconnected from the reality of what we'd see in an all-out nuclear war. So organizations like Physicians for Social, Social Responsibility around 1979 started saying this a lot publicly. They would do a bombing run. They'd go to your city and they'd say, here's a map of your city, here's what's going to happen if we get a nuclear hit. So no possibility of medical response to or meaningful preparedness for all-out nuclear war. So we had to prevent nuclear war if we expected to survive. This disconnect was never actually resolved. And what happened was, when we get into chapter two of the nuclear threat era, which started back in 1945, chapter two starts in 1991. When the Soviet Union broke up, we effectively lost that adversary as a potential attacker of the United States, for the most part. It's not completely gone, I'm gonna come back to that. But from 1991, uh, through the present time, emphasized by the attacks of 2001, the idea of an all-out nuclear war has diminished, and the idea of a single event act of nuclear terrorism is what we have instead. Um, although the scenario has changed very considerably, the fact is that we haven't changed our mental image of what a nuclear war means. I'm going to tell you what the implications of that are in just a second. So what is a nuclear terror threat? And there's four key ingredients to uh, describing that. First thing is that the global nuclear weapons in the stockpiles that I showed you in those original maps happens to be not uniformly secure, and it's particularly not secure in the former Soviet Union, now in Russia. 
There are many, many sites where warheads are stored, and in fact, lots of sites where fissionable materials like highly enriched uranium and plutonium are absolutely not safe. They're available to be bought, stolen, whatever. They're acquirable, let me put it that way. Uh, from 1993 to 2006, the International Atomic Energy Agency documented 175 cases of nuclear theft, 18 of which involved highly enriched uranium or plutonium, the key ingredients to make uh, a nuclear weapon. The global stockpile of highly enriched uranium is about 1,300 at the low end to about 2,100 metric tons. More than 100 megatons of this is stored in particularly insecure Russian facilities. How much of that do you think it would take to actually build a 10 kiloton bomb? Well, you need about 75 pounds of it. So what I'd like to show you is what it would take to hold 75 pounds of highly rich uranium. This is not a product placement. It's just, in fact, if I was Coca-Cola, I'd be pretty distressed about this. But, <laughs> but, but basically, this is it. This is what you would need to steal or buy out of that 100 metric ton stockpile that's relatively insecure to create the type of bomb that was used in Hiroshima. Now, you might want to look at plutonium as another fissionable material that you might use in a bomb. That you'd need 10 to 13 pounds of plutonium. Now, plutonium, 10 to 13 pounds, this. This is enough plutonium to create a Nagasaki-sized atomic weapon. Now, this situation already, I, you know, I, I don't really like thinking about this, although somehow I got myself a job where I have to think about it. So the point is that we're very, very insecure in terms of developing this material. The second thing is, what about the know-how? And there's a lot of controversy about whether terror organizations have the know-how to actually uh, make a nuclear weapon. Well, there's a lot of know-how out there. There's an unbelievable amount of know-how out there. There's detailed information how to assemble a nuclear weapon from parts. There's books about how to build a nuclear bomb. There are plans for how to create a terror farm where you could actually manufacture and develop all the components and assemble it. All of this information is relatively available. If you have an undergraduate degree in physics, I would suggest, although I don't, so maybe it's not even true, but something close to that would allow you, with the information that's currently available, to actually build a nuclear weapon. The third element of the nuclear terror threat is that who would actually do such a thing? Well, what we're seeing now is a level of terrorism that involves individuals who are highly organized, they are very dedicated and committed, they are stateless. Somebody once said, Al-Qaeda does not have a return address. So if they attacked us with a nuclear weapon, what's the response? And to whom is the response? And they're retaliation proof. Since there's no real retribution possible that would make any difference, since there are people willing to actually give up their lives in order to do a lot of damage to us, it, it becomes apparent that the whole notion of this mutually assured destruction would not work. Here's Suleiman Abugith, and Suleiman was a key lieutenant of Osama bin Laden. He wrote many, many times statements to this effect, we have the right to kill four million Americans, two million of whom should be children. And we don't have to go overseas to find people willing to do harm for whatever their reasons. McVeigh and Nichols and the Oklahoma City attack uh, in the 1990s was a good example of homegrown terrorists. What if they had gotten their hands on a nuclear weapon? The fourth element is that the high-value U.S. targets are accessible, soft, and plentiful. This would be a talk for another day, but the level of preparedness that the United States has achieved since 9-11 of 01 is unbelievably inadequate. What you saw after Katrina is a very good indicator of how little prepared the United States is for any kind of a major attack. Seven million ship cargo containers come into the United States every year. Five to seven percent only are inspected. Five to seven percent. This is Alexander Lebed, who was a general that worked with Yeltsin, who talked about and presented to Congress this idea that the Russians had developed these suitcase bombs. They were very low yield, 0.1 to 1 kiloton. Hiroshima was around 13 kilotons, but enough to do an unbelievable amount of damage. And Lebed came to the United States 
and told us that many, many, more than 80 of the suitcase bombs were actually not accountable. And they look like this. They're basically very simple arrangements. You put the elements into a suitcase, it becomes very portable. The suitcase can be conveniently dropped in your trunk of your car. You take it wherever you want to take it, and you can detonate it. You uh, don't want to build a suitcase bomb, and you happen to get one of those insecure uh, uh, nuclear warheads that exist. This is the size of the uh, little boy bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. It was 9.8 feet long, weighed 8,800 pounds. You go down to your local uh, rent-a-truck, and uh, for 50 bucks or so, you rent a truck that's got the right capacity, and you take your bomb, you put it in the truck, and you're ready to go. It could happen, but what it would mean, and who would survive? You can't get an exact number for that kind of probability, but what I'm trying to say is that we have all the elements of that happening. Anybody who dismisses the thought of a nuclear weapon being used by a terrorist is kidding themselves. I think there's a lot of people in the intelligence community, a lot of people who deal with this work in general, think it's almost inevitable unless we do certain things to really, to, to really try to defuse the risk, like better interdiction, better prevention, better fixing, you know, better uh, screening of uh, cargo containers that are coming into the country and so forth. There's a lot that can be done to make us a lot safer. At this particular moment, we actually could end up seeing a nuclear detonation in, in one of our cities. I don't think we would see an all-out nuclear war anytime soon, although even that is not completely off the table. There's still enough nuclear weapons in the arsenals of the superpowers to destroy the Earth many, many times over. There are flashpoints in India and Pakistan, uh, in the Middle East, uh, in North Korea, and other places where the use of nuclear weapons, while initially locally, could very rapidly go into a situation where we would be facing all-out uh, nuclear war. It's very unsettling. Here we go. Okay. I'm back in my truck, and we drove over the uh, Brooklyn Bridge. We're coming down, and we bring that truck that you just saw somewhere in here in the financial district. This is a 10 kiloton bomb slightly smaller than was used in Hiroshima. And I want to just conclude this by just giving you some information, I think, news you can use kind of concept here. So first of all, this would be horrific beyond anything we can possibly imagine. This is the ultimate. And if you're in the half-mile radius of where this bomb went off, you have a 90% chance of not making it. If you're right where the bomb uh, went off, you will be vaporized. And that's, I'm just telling you, this is, this is not good. You assume that. Two-mile radius, you have a 50% chance of being killed, and up to about eight miles away, that point about killed instantly, uh, somewhere between a 10 and 20% uh, chance of getting killed. The thing about this is that the experience of the nuclear detonation is, first of all, tens of millions of degrees Fahrenheit at the core here where it goes off, and uh, an extraordinary amount of energy in the form of heat, acute radiation, and blast effects. An enormous hurricane-like wind uh, and destruction of buildings almost totally within this uh, yellow circle here. And what I'm going to focus on at, as I come to the conclusion here is that what happens to you if you're in here? Well, if we're talking about the old days of an all-out nuclear attack, you up here are as dead as the people here. So it was a moot point. My point now, though, is that there's a lot that we could do for you who are in here if you've survived the initial blast. You have, when the blast goes off, and by the way, if it ever comes up, don't look at it. <laughs> if you look at it, you're going to be blind uh, either temporarily or permanently. So if there's any way that you can avoid, like avert your eyes, that would be a good thing. If you find yourself alive, but you're in the vicinity of a nuclear weapon, you have, that's gone off, you have 10 to 20 minutes, depending on the size and exactly where it went off, to get out of the way before a lethal amount of radiation comes straight down from the, from the mushroom cloud that goes up. In that 10 to 15 minutes, all you have to do, and I mean this seriously, is go about a mile away from the blast. And what happens is, this is, I'm going to show you now some fallout plumes. Within 20 minutes, it comes straight down. Within 24 hours, lethal radiation is going out with prevailing winds, and it's mostly in this particular direction, it's going uh, northeast. And if you're 
in this vicinity, you've got to get away. So you're feeling the wind, and there's tremendous wind now that you're going to be feeling, and you want to go perpendicular to the wind or downwind if you are, in fact, able to see where the blast was in front of you. You've got to get out of there. If you don't get out of there, you're going to be exposed to lethal radiation in very short order. If you can't get out of there, we want you to go into a shelter and stay there. Now, a shelter in an urban area means you, you have to be either in a basement as deep as possible, or you have to be on a floor, on a high floor, if it's a ground burst explosion, which it would be, higher than the ninth floor. So you have to be 10th floor or higher, or in the basement. Uh, but basically, you got to get out of town as quickly as possible. And if you do that, you actually can survive a nuclear blast. Over the next few days to a week, there will be a radiation cloud, again, going with the wind and settling down for another 15 or 20 miles out, in this case, over Long Island. And if you're in the direct fallout zone here, you really have to either be sheltered or you have to get out of there. And that's, that's clear. But if you are sheltered, you can actually survive. The difference between knowing information of what you're going to do personally and not knowing information can save your life. And it can mean the difference between 150 to 200,000 fatalities from something like this uh, and half a million to 700,000 fatalities. So response planning in the 21st century is both possible and is essential. But in 2008, there was one single American city that has done effective plans to deal with a nuclear detonation disaster. Part of the problem is that the emergency planners themselves personally are overwhelmed psychologically by the thought of nuclear catastrophe. They are paralyzed. You say nuclear to them and they're thinking, oh my God, we're all gone. What's the point? It's futile. And we're trying to tell them it's not futile. We can change the survival rates by doing uh, some commonsensical things. So the goal here is to minimize fatalities and I just want to leave you with the personal points that I, I think you might be interested in. The key to surviving a nuclear blast is getting out and not going into harm's way. That's basically all we're going to be talking about here. And the farther you are away in distance, the longer it is in time from the initial blast, and the more separation between you and the outside atmosphere, the better. So separation, hopefully with dirt or concrete, or being in a basement, uh, distance and time is what will save you. So here's what you do. First of all, as I said, don't stare at the light flash. If you can, I don't know how you could possibly resist doing that, but let's assume theoretically you want to do that. You want to keep your mouth open so your eardrums don't burst from the, from the uh, pressures. If you're very close to what happened, you actually do have to duck and cover like Bert told you, Bert the turtle. And you want to get under something so that you're not injured or killed by objects, if that's at all possible. You want to get away from the initial fallout mushroom cloud, I said in just a few minutes, and shelter in place. You want to move downwind or crosswind for 1.2 miles. You know, if you're, if you're out there and you see buildings horribly destroyed and down in that direction, less destroyed here, then you know that it was over there, the blast, and you're going this way, as long as you're uh, going cross, crosswise to the wind. Once you're out and evacuating, you want to keep as much of your skin, your mouth and nose covered, as long as that covering doesn't impede you moving and getting out of there. And finally, you want to get decontaminated as soon as possible. And if you're wearing clothing, you're taking off your clothing, you're going to get showered down someplace and remove the radiation that would be uh, the, the radioactive material that might be on you. And then you want to stay in shelter for 48 to 72 hours minimum, but you're going to wait, hopefully. You'll have your little wind-up uh, battery-less radio, and you'll be waiting for people to tell you when it's safe to go outside. That's what you need to do. In conclusion, nuclear war is less likely than before, but by no means out of the question, and it's not survivable. Nuclear terrorism is possible, maybe probable, but is survivable. And this is Jack Geiger, who's one of the heroes of the U.S. Uh, public health uh, community, and Jack said, the only way to deal with nuclear anything, whether it's war or terrorism, is abolition of nuclear weapons. And you want something to work on once you fix global warming, I urge you to think about the fact that we have to do something about this unacceptable, inhumane reality of nuclear weapons uh, in our world. Now, this is my favorite civil defense slide, and uh, <clears throat> I don't want to be indelicate, but <clears throat> this... He's no longer in office, we don't really care. Okay. This was uh, sent to me by somebody who uh, is an aficionado of, of uh, civil defense procedures. But the fact of the matter is that America's gone through a very hard time. We've not been focused. We've not done what we had to do. And now we're facing the potential of 
to add hell on earth. Thank you.